Hi, my name is Patty Nowak. I'm the owner of Control M Solutions. Today I'll be discussing how to use the Plex concept of negative bond quantities to account for planned scrap value. Thanks for joining our weekly session. We started these a couple weeks back to help Plex users keep sharp during the pandemic, and it's been so well received that I decided I would keep on doing it. So these sessions are for everybody in the community. They're not just for our clients, so feel free to share them with anybody that you'd like. Having said that, let's get started with about 30 minutes of some costing fun. Look, I, I hate reading slides to people, so while I know you're reading the agenda, I'll give you a little history of this construct. It was designed uh, by and implemented for Jagaman Stamping Company in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, who I used to work for, and it's where I first implemented Flex. The CFO there wanted visibility to scrap credit values by parts, so Plex designed it in. But I'm not sure how well it was socialized internally or externally at Plex back then. That was 2008 when enhancements used to be pushed out to system admins and bulk messages. We didn't have the community back then, so news was just a little bit harder to get out. Uh, anyway, I think this is a pretty ingenious construct, and I would say maybe a third of our customers use it. Not everyone's a great fit for it, but if you are, it can potentially change visibility to costing and granular profitability. A special welcome to the food and Bev folks on the call. For those of you who are not familiar with it, Plex has changed some terms around for them. For example, food and Bev industry calls routings recipes and they call parts items. For non-food and Bev folks, items are supplies. So trust me, we aren't talking about the supply system in this presentation. If you hear me say the word item, it's meant for the food and bev folks, and I mean parts. I assume most of you on the call know uh, what basic concepts are like a part or item, master record, a routing or recipe, or a bill of material or ingredients are, and what a cost structure is. If you don't, the routing or recipe tells us how we make something. It's the verbs that we use to describe our process. And a bill of materials is what we make things out of, like ingredients. And finally, the cost structure is what dollarizes the routing or recipe and the bill of material to tell us what we expect this part or product to cost at standard. We're gonna use, as an example, a washer part for these discussions. Why? Well, it's because I've got limited drawing, uh, limited graphic uh, artist skills, and it's a pretty easy thing to draw. So anyway, for our discussions, pretend that this blue area here is a strip or coil of steel that we're stamping washers out of. So the yellow is the washer, and the blue is really planned off fall. In this example, our washer weighs a quarter pound and it uses a pound of steel for the bill of material. So the box with the A in it is really the entire length of the webbing required to make one part. It goes from the start of one part to the start of the next, and that would be what Plex uses for planning. If you're in food, this might be a cup of flour or a whole potato that we're turning into french fries. But in this washer example, we're pretending we take a one pound piece of strip and we stamp out a quarter pound washer. That means that we have three quarters of a pound that either fall out of the middle of the washer or they're in the webbing left behind. In our example, we have a standard cost of 93 and a half cents a pound for the raw material and a scrap value when we sell the scrap to our scrap dealer of 30 cents a pound. And finally, we're going to sell this washer for a dollar and a half. Now, these are arbitrary numbers. I just use existing parts in my PCN that would clearly how, show how this works. And I'm going to use this part for all of our examples today. If you aren't a washer stamper, please stay tuned. There are plenty more applications that this will work for. They just aren't as universal to discuss or as easy for me to draw. Everybody knows what a washer is and you can grasp the concept or the recipe construct pretty easy to make training simple. It's just a, a stamp. And remember when I say routing in food, I mean recipe. So here's my part cost structure for the big expensive washer. See how our bomb quantity is one pound and we have a cost of 93 and a half cents. Uh, I know that's expensive for steel 
but that's what the last purchase order in my PCN was cut for. Um, remember when I sell this washer for a dollar and a half, uh, but our park cost or sh structure shows a value of almost nine cents over that because it isn't considering any value to that scrap that falls off. Now let's see what our gross margin looks like when I sell it. I actually sold a thousand of these pieces on Monday. And here's our gross margin report. We can see that when I sell this for $1.50, we're losing money. In fact, we're losing almost $88 on these parts. Nobody likes a negative gross margin. So if you have to price your finished goods to market, which most customers do, and the market knows you get a scrap value, you can't just pretend it doesn't exist. We don't pretend it doesn't exist when pricing. So all we have to do is teach Plex how to learn what that is. And that's pretty easy using negative bill of material construct. Best fits? Well, I hate to state the obvious, but washers. But seriously, any metal forming environment that has off fall that is either sold off for scrap value or reused is a natural fit. Other places we see this used is in plastics and foams to capture regrind material. In those cases, they know that when producing a billet of foam or a roll of plastic film or something blow molded, that there's gonna be some scrap that can come off the seams or edges or excess product left behind in the melter that you can plan on using. It's a legit combination in your bill of material. This is also pertinent foods. Again, back to the, French, the potato that gets turned into French fries. Maybe in your process, you take the skins off those potatoes and sell them for something like pet food starch or the peels off of oranges to be sold for essential oils. So if a component of the parts or items you make is either reusable or resaleable, this construct is a perfect fit for bringing that into your costing system. It can be used in any industry where you want to account for some type of material cost recapture that is related to the making of the product. Before I show you ways to use this, let's talk about some of the coping mechanisms that we see either at current Plex customers or customers we're implementing. And the reason I wanna talk about these is because if you're doing one of them, this presentation might help you see how negative bombs can make your process simpler. The first one uses manual cost records that are uploaded directly to finished good parts. That's not that bad of a solution. They can typically be unloaded, locked, or unlocked. We sometimes see folks create a cost type of material scrap for this, and the costs are calculated and uploaded to your primary cost model, generally by your costing team. Your primary cost model is not a place that you want folks other than accounting working in. And if you have monthly book to perpetual mismatches where your general ledger does not match what Plex says it should, you already know why this should be security controlled. If in fact you do have that problem, give me a call. We have a pretty good process for figuring those things out. But what if the, prop, the part changes? Maybe new tooling that gets better utilization or the washer size changes without impacting the bomb, like with an internal diameter change. Engineering and production will know about it, but will accounting? Do you have such a great feedback loop in your company that accounting always knows when products change? Because if you do, I'd like to get a copy of that. Most of our customers don't have that great feedback loop. So the method of using manually calculated and uploaded costs really puts the work on a group that isn't always intimately aware of these changes when they happen. The second one we see is a bomb quantity change to reflect the part weight. That is a slippery slope in so many ways, and it severely limits your planning engine functionality with Inplex, because remember, the bill of material quantity or the ingredients list quantity is what tells the planning engine what to buy. Now, we've had some customers who think that this is okay to set the bond to the actual part weight. In fact, we've gotten into some spirited conversations about this while customers try to convince me that's the right thing to do. But what if we did set the bill of material to a quarter pound of steel to match part weight instead of the real consumption? Well, costing might be closer to accurate, but the planning engine would have no idea how to tell us how much steel we really need to make this part, would it? Back to the justifications I hear, my client comes back and says, well, we know we have to buy four times what the system says. That's what our old system told us, and that's we've gotten used to it, and we know how. 
Well, I say, well, that's great. If you want to make that decision, I can't stop you. But what happens when your buyer wins the lottery and quits? Will the replacement buyer know what to do? And how is that impacting your inventory turns? Because it's not always a 75% loss, is it? What if you use this coil now to something that can get better utilization and your buyer buys four times as much? That's excess inventory. How can anyone do the kind of, that kind of math in their head? And more importantly, why would you do it? In essence, setting the bomb weight to the part weight when you have off fall means you're lying to Plex. And if you know me at all, you know what I say. Plex is like your mother. If you lie to her, she'll know and you're gonna pay the price. And the price in setting that bomb with the incorrect quantity is mental MRP. And where you knew, when you're using mental MRP and you're not, in, you're not optimizing inventory turns. And we know that managing turns is the same as managing cash and that's important every day. Despite our pleas and challenges it creates, some users absolutely insist that their bomb must match the part weight. And then they just do a scrap transaction to write up the remaining source material to accommodate this loss. But depending on how you actually record that, either using a scrap transaction, a true up, a retire, you're gonna have different results in your financial statements. And if there's one thing everybody wants out of their financials, it's predictability and explainable results. Finally, unless you pick the right transaction at the right time, those scrap transactions aren't gonna be linked to a job or part. So once again, profitability per part is blurred. Finally, there's the idea of institutional knowledge where we just know that we have a scrap value. That's great if you don't mind not being able to rely on the reporting that you're getting direct from Plex, or if you like waiting for somebody into account, in accounting to manually update and upload those costs, or if you don't care if they're out of date. Or worse yet, if you are calculating true profit off the books in Excel. Hiding all of that great knowledge in your cost accountant's head yeah, that's great that he's got job security, but it really diminishes the true power of Plex by hiding margin visibility in real time to everyone in the company so that you can all make good decisions in real time. Plex is so powerful. Since it can do this, why not let it do it? The setup is quite easy. In fact, there's almost none. You just create a part for this off ball and throw it in your finished good parts bomb with a negative quantity. Done, presentation over. Just kidding, I'll walk you through it. Conceptually, the off ball has to be created as a part or item with a routing or recipe. Without that step, it couldn't be set up as a bomb item. I typically receive, use receive uh, by unit because some folks wanna see this in their MRP if they're reusing their own scrap. And remember, when we use the word item, we're, we're talking to the food people, that really means part. We set up the off fall part routing or recipe in units in the measurement that we want to apply to the cost reduction. These units are typically in alignment with the unit being consumed that causes the off fall. For example, we're using steel in pounds and our scrap is in pounds, so I've got to receive pounds operation. You need a new part or item for each unit. For example, in food, if you get different units of scrap on a mixed product, you could take, you could create different scrap off ball items or parts with different receive units, and you can have more than one negative bomb quantity to track the units differently. We've worked with clients who have a single part to account for all off ball, and others who get more granular due to cost or value of the off ball. For example, let's say you're in a shop where you use different metals that have different scrap values. Steel, brass, and aluminum each have drastically different value. Same thing with the reclaim of things like PETG or HDPE and plastics and foam. They might be used or valued differently if there are different colorants or additives. And maybe you get more value for unprocessed food waste than for processed food waste. If that's you, then it's okay to set up multiple off-ball parts with different values. I generally recommend giving them a separate part group or a part type to isolate them from regular part groups. I select how to identify them based on your setup of cost accounts in the third dimension. For example, if you're driving cost accounts by part group, then set these up as a separate part group. Once we have the part, the off ball part set up, here's how it looks when we assign it to a bomb item on our big expensive washer part. 
the component part number is called out the same way as normal, we just enter a negative quantity. And these flags matter. We're gonna talk about those in depth in a few slides. But now when we have the entire bomb or ingredients listed here, we can see that the off ball offsets the regular steel part. Now I recognize that it's not realistic that we would get 100% off ball value from this, but I did wanna make it as simple as possible. Since we don't purchase this part, the cost algorithm will not be able to get a cost for this from anything. I suppose technically we could cut a PO for this and never do anything with it, but that seems like work for the sake of work to me. Unless of course you wanna have your purchasing department value the scrap for you, I suppose it could be done. We also have customers who purchase scrap as well as create it, but they're not always considered at the same value because when we buy scrap, we pay more for it than when we get when we sell scrap. So we typically see those being different parts. So for simplicity, I suggest we just upload a manual cost right to the cost structure. And it doesn't matter if it's locked or unlocked if you're not cutting a PO, because the only way you'll likely update it is by an upload. I put in a manual cost on the off ball scrap part of 30 cents a pound. That's pretty easy to add manually and it can be uploaded every month with an upload. Most scrap values are commodities that change regularly. So you just create this spreadsheet and upload and it'll overwrite what's there. It's pretty simple. Again, I used material and material. You could use material scrap if you want to. Now that my scrap is costed and it's on the bomb for my big expensive washer with a negative quantity, all I have to do is recalculate my part cost structure for the big expensive washer and voila, the scrap value is taken off the part. Here's an updated version of the part cost structure and you can see that the 22 and a half cents of scrap reduces the value. Remember it used to be about $1.58, now it's $1.36. It looks far more realistic and profitable. Driving the standard cost activity report's pretty simple. One thing you need to know is please know that this does not create inventory or build inventory. I don't build three quarters of a pound of scrap when I produce my part. If you wanna do that, you're gonna to need to use what are called companion parts. And you wanna make sure that you don't double dip on the inventory impacts with SCAR. If you're considering using uh, both of these constructs together, I'm gonna to recommend that you watch Danielle's presentation last week on companion parts. It's posted up on our YouTube channel. That'll help you make inventory, but I wanna stay focused on costing and negative bombs on this presentation. So we'll go back to costing. You wanna make sure to set up cost accounts or drive your debits and credits for your off fall parts in line with your current practices. Take some time to remind yourself of what's currently happening without the negative bomb construct and then how you want the negative bomb construct to impact your financials moving forward. In our example, I had a bomb of one pound of steel that's debiting finished goods and crediting raw. Good. We know that the raw material is fully depleted now, but our finished goods is really overvalued by the amount of scrap at that point. The easiest way for me to see this is with T accounts. Um, I think for me, this makes the most, the most sense. The top line shows how my regular bomb item goes through the general ledger. We credit raw and we debit finished goods for one pound. The second line shows the production, the same production transaction, now throwing a second entry to account for that scrap value. The entire bomb is already out of raw, so we don't want to pull it out of raw and the finished goods is overvalued by the amount of scrap. So we're reducing finished goods and we're booking the offset to scrap expense. Why? Because it really is expense. Now you need to make sure that you're not doubling down with a transaction for that scrap, because if you are, it will double down. It shouldn't be because Plex has already depleted it. So Plex already knows it's gone. But if your process has you doing some sort of transaction to record this as scrap, be careful when rolling this out. When considering debits and credits, remember the regular bomb already fully depleted raw materials. You don't want to take any more out and it's moved it to finished goods. So we want to reduce that by the scrap amount. Otherwise you're going to be double dipping the raw depletion. 
you control the debit side of this using your cost accounts. For us, it made sense to put it in this graph account, but this is a theoretical test PCM. We don't make anything. And I'm not an accountant by trade. Only you can determine your debits and credits based on your current financials and production transaction. You can see when I sell this now, I'm crediting finished goods for the amount of inventory that went in there, debiting COGS. And finally, when I sell the scrap, I can offset the scrap expense. In this way, I can, I can measure expected scrap against actual scrap. Here's what SCAR looks like after I've produced uh, materials and sold them and generated SCAR. We're gonna start with the teal and the purple lines. These are the material cost entries that occurred when I reported production of a thousand pieces of this part. The T line shows where we are crediting the raw and debiting finished goods, pretty standard behavior. Of course, if you only have one inventory account, then this is a wash. You don't have to break inventory general ledger accounts into finished goods, whip and raw. Then the purple line shows where we are uh, reducing the finished goods. We're crediting finished goods by the amount of scrap and then we write the offset to the scrap account. So the remainder in finished goods is the cost of the metal minus the scrap. And when we ship, all that comes out of there is the difference between these two. It's pretty clear when we have a nice, simple example. And now, let's like at the beautiful gross margin, once we've made this change to add that negative bond component and recalculated the cost model, look how pretty this is. It's significantly more sane. Remember the gross margin report before? It showed a loss of almost 88 bucks. Now that we know that we can sell this scrap, this is much more realistic. A couple of things to remember. First of all, those bomb flags are key here. Let's review what each one means. And although I said I hated reading PowerPoints to you, this one's worth it. In this case, active, this means this is an active bill of material component on the part. Remember in Plex, we never delete, we just deactivate. Validate is off because we don't want to load it at control panel. When this is checked, it says this must be loaded at control panel to produce. Auto deplete means reduce my inventory as I consume. Well, if we're not keeping inventory, we don't want to deplete. And transfer heat means pull the heat code from my source code, or from my source container into my output container. Since we're not loading a source, that stays off as well. Another warning, don't use a positive bond quantity with a negative cost value. That might seem okay to swap this, but doing so leads to these being booked as manufacturing variances. And those are hard enough to analyze. There's no point in putting extra lines of data in there. And this is pretty simple to roll out. So for new parts, once your off ball is created, just have your engineers put the negative scrap bomb quantities on those parts. Advise them of these flags first. And if you're creating a new part type for these, make sure include in standard is flagged on the part type setup table. I'll show you that when we pop into Plex. It's not turned on for everyone, but if it's turned on for you, you're gonna wanna make sure that flag is on. Finally, you can easily upload these negative bomb quantities to existing parts to get you going really quickly. Here's a picture of the bomb upload for this part, how it looks with negative items. See how I've got my off ball scrap part here and a negative 0.75? You're gonna have to enable a customer setting called upload allow negative quantity for this to work. Once you do that, it's a piece of cake. And even these flags will populate automatically if it's set correctly. As always, I strongly, remember, I strongly recommend that you run this in test first. So run it in your test database, recalculate your costs, and look at the cost model comparison screen to see where the differences are. All right, next, let's jump in Plex. That's enough theory, we'll take a peek under the hood. Now, for those of you who are joining us that are using Classic, we're gonna play in UX, but candidly, it works the same as it does in Classic. So I'm in Plex, I'm in Plex uh, UX right now, and I'm gonna start with the routing screen. And the first screen that I'm gonna look at here is the routing for big expensive washer. And you can see here on the bill of material, we're showing both parts, off ball scrap and steel coil. When I click on that, I can see the components here, my minus 0.75 pounds of off ball and my one pound of steel. And when I click on this, you can see that my flags are set per the example that I showed you. That might be just a little bit too big. We maybe make it a little bit smaller. Okay. 
If I want to look at the off ball part itself by going into the part master, I can take a look at this part sub menu and routing. And you'll notice on this routing, I have a receive operation just as though I'm going to, just as though I'm going to purchase it. And again, this is useful for folks who use their off ball as part of their production process. I don't have an approved supplier because I'm not set up to purchase and produce this as well. And when I look at this part as well, I can also see my part cost. Whoops, I clicked on big expensive washer, sorry. In this off ball part here, I can look at my uh, exploded cost structure and you'll see my manual cost that's been entered here. I've created a job for this part. It's job number 55. When I look at this job and look at the bill of material for it, you'll see that it looks just like the part bomb. And in here, the flags are the same. In here, the flags are the same. Sorry about that. I clicked on the wrong place. In here, the flags are the same as they were on the part. Finally, let's take a peek in control panel. I've got my job for my big expensive washer loaded up and I'm logged in. When I go to record production here, the only source that Plex wants is the steel coil because that validate flag is not on. As soon as I load up my steel coil, I'm going to be ready to produce. Pretty simple so far, you'll see this turn green. And the last thing I wanted to show you in Plex is this part type table. If you see this include in standard cost column enabled in your PCN, make sure that's flagged for all part types that you want to throw records in SCAR. If you don't see it, you can easily turn it on by going into maintenance. It's the same as I said in classic or UX. Turn this on and then you'll see which ones are costed and which ones are not. So pretty simple construct, pretty straightforward, I think anyway. What do you think? So let's open the floor to chats and I'm gonna begin by looking in the chat if I can. Questions? Hey Patty, I put one in the chat. Um, I'm sure, not sure why I didn't see it, but. It might be question. because I'm sharing and I can't see the chat when I'm sharing. <laughs> okay, so my question is, most of the, this referred to reusing the scrap, it sounded to me like. So what if you don't use reuse the scrap? What if you actually throw away the scrap? Um, and if you, if you're actually throwing it away um, and you, and you do this, uh, you're reducing the value of the cost, you're reducing the cost value. And so therefore you're not using uh, the full value of everything you received for the value of the finished good. Well, that's a pretty good conceptual conversation, Russ. So I'm going to go back to my, uh, back to my picture here. So Russ's question is, if I throw this in the garbage, the centerpiece in the garbage, uh, Plex still understands that you use, if your bill of material is one pound, Plex still understands that you use the entire thing. So it will account for all of that usage. This construct is really for reselling or reusing the off fall. So in the world of stamping, which is where I started using Plex, they would have scrap bins all over the place and we would sell that scrap for value. This is a way to account for the sale of that scrap as a reduction in material cost. If you're throwing away the scrap, you're not really reducing the cost of the part at all. You should account for the entire one pound. Is that correct? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm thinking too. Yeah. yeah, okay. That was my, that's what I thought, but I just wanted to make sure. Good question. Thanks. Who else has questions for us? Only one question? Is anyone still awake? <laughs> Patty, I have a question. Great. Yeah, so let's say for example, on the scrap that you have, right? So like what he said, it will be thrown away. If I understand it correctly, when you report production on a negative bill of materials, it creates inventory, right? No, it, it cannot create inventory. 
if you want to create scrap inventory, you should use something called command uh, companion parts. Mm. Yeah, this this does this does not take uh, this does not create inventory. So even though you report on the control panel, it will not create inventory at all. Right. So remember here, when I'm in control panel, when I went to record production, the only source I loaded was my steel coil. So this construct, the way we have it set up, is for costing only. It does not create scrap inventory. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else got any additional questions? So, so whenever, whenever, um, whenever the um, whenever the process takes place, uh, so it's it's going to it's going to decrease the inventory by the full amount of the one pound, for example. Right. Um, it's just basically, uh, so for inventory, it's going to decrease it by one pound, but for costing purposes, it's going to um, only uh, uh, put the standard cost, use the standard cost of the reduced amount for the value. Is that kind of the way of looking at it? Um, I'm going to go back to this slide here. So this example here, before we put the scrap credit in. Right. This yeah. would be an inventory at a dollar fifty eight point seven eight cents. So it right. includes the entire one pound of steel. Right. Now, if I can sell some of that steel and get money back, I want to reduce my cost. But yeah. if it's going into the garbage, I don't think I'd want to reduce my cost. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But when you do reduce that cost, like you showed on that before, then um, the actual value of the finished good is reduced but your inventory stays the same no your inventory, the in the, this your inventory is unit a, your inventory value reduces but your inventory unit stays the same co correct yeah correct. okay that's a All great right. way to put it russ the value yeah. was reduced by 22 and a half cents so my part my one expensive washer is inventory a dollar 36 i still have one washer right and my raw was depleted by one pound right Okay. And I just know that I have scrap sitting somewhere in a bin. The system right. doesn't show that scrap inventory at all. Okay, so if you want to sell that inventory, if you want to sell that scrap, um, how how are you gonna how are you gonna add it in? Is there a way to add it into inventory? Or are you gonna sell it out as a supply item or? I just, how? Typically, typically how we've seen that work, especially in the metals industry, is uh, Joe Scrap Dealer comes by, weighs, uh, he takes all your scrap back to his scale, he tells you how much he took, and he gives you a check for it. So when you get the check, you're going to debit cash and credit your scrap expense account, and that way what shows up in your scrap expense is a net. Now, if in the, for example, in the food industry, Maybe you need to say, I'm going to take my potato and I'm gonna cut it into a square so I get all the skins off or cut it into a cube to get all the skins off and I can sell those skins somewhere else. I would personally do that either with a multi-out or with companion parts. Companion okay. parts says, uh, companion parts says when I make, when I turn a potato into French fries, I get, 16 french fries and four potato skins or maybe i would only get three this time or two it says when i make this that sort of happens it's similar to a multi out if you worked with multi outs before but it's just a little bit easier for your operator and less work for your engineers okay so with the off -ball method then you're you're actually uh, with the steel like you're talking about. Actually, I, I actually worked for a company one time and I actually did uh, sell the steel. I, I worked for a steel company, so I know what you're talking about. Um, but uh, what I'm thinking about here is you don't, where do you have visibility as to the total amount of, of steel that you have or approximately how much? Um, did you, did you, there's, I mean there, when we were there, of course that was 20 years ago, and we just kept track on a spreadsheet. But my question is, uh, is there, 
somewhere you would recommend in Plex where you would say, okay, um, I'm, I'm building up this amount of steel over a period of two weeks. I think I got approximately this amount, but I don't know for sure. Do you, you do anything like that? Yep. If you take this construct in tandem with companion parts together, then you can do that. And it's, it's okay. actually quite elegant. What happens is, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't. I don't know if I'm in the right PCN to show this. So I'll kind of go off. I'll kind of go off the. Uh, if I can find that part that Danielle did last week with companion parts, let me see if I can. If I can find. Yeah, I would. I wouldn't be able. It probably would take me too long to find it. But if you go <laughs> onto my YouTube channel and you watch last week's presentation on companion parts. Uh, you will see how to do that. Danielle Giles went through it last week. And I think we didn't have a lot of people at that session because I don't think people really understand what it is. But we can use these two constructs together to say, not only will I reduce my value uh, of this, but I can also build the inventory of that. So you can use them together. In fact, I'm doing an implementation now where we're actually doing that because this company wants to reduce the cost of their parts by scrap and then it's regrind so they reuse it. Hmm. I'd be happy okay. to show you that if you'd like. Yeah, no, I'm just curious, but we don't do any of the companion parts types. We don't we really don't have any uh thing of any value that falls off of the pickles or peppers that we can sell. So we it, it's just the companion parts is really not applicable to us for that reason. But um I, you know, I understand the concept. Um, Great. Thanks, Ross. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thanks, guys. I know this was pretty deep and technical. Uh, we're going to take a week off. It's summer and everyone has to squeeze in as much fun as they can in these crazy days. But when we come back the first week of August, we're going to talk about annual maintenance for your Plex implementation. And I'm, I'm not talking about a contract, but I'm not trying to sell you anything. I just want to talk to you about the tables that need to be reviewed at least annually to make sure your system is running in tip-top shape. And this is going to cover all departments, not just accounting or HR who have to do annual maintenance. So I hope to see you then. Uh, watch your email for more details. And thank you so much for joining us today. Remember our YouTube channel and give us a thumbs up if you can. We like everybody else, you know, we want to know that we're relevant and that you appreciate what we do and it helps us to keep putting these presentations on. And a big thanks to our Jill Baden for making these sessions happen. Uh, email her, Jill at Control M, if you want to get on our mailing list. And have a great day. Thanks and stay safe. Thanks, Patty.